Um, very good. Welcome to the, uh, sorry, this is not turned on. Check, yes, sorry. Welcome to the, well, not last lecture from myself, but last lecture from this part uh, of the course. Uh, you will now have an Easter break and then uh, Philip will continue with uh, his block of the course. And I will return only for the last two weeks. Um, and for today's lecture, I essentially continue what we started discussing yesterday, the topic of unsharp measurements. So as I said, there were um, when I presented the projection postulate at the beginning of the lecture, there were three things that weren't somehow explicit in this projection postulate of quantum mechanics. One of them was, well, what is how do you actually end up seeing the observable? What is the physical pointer that you use? How do you model that? And so we, we put that in. Um, the second thing was, uh, yes, the, the spectrum between strong measurements and doing nothing. Is, is, is there something interesting in between where you can say, we, we disturb the system, but not fully, and we gain information, but not, but not fully. So it's just partial information, partial disturbance. And of course, whether that is in some sense non-trivial. So for example, whether that gives you more than just probabilistically choosing between, oh, I just make a strong measurement or I do nothing. And in the lecture, as we discussed, and in the tutorial, as you saw as well, there is, of course, a, oh, there is an advantage to having unsharp measurements that's different from just mixtures of strong and weak. So the one thing that we I mentioned yesterday, but we didn't yet cover, and that's the goal of today's lecture, is to understand macroscopic measurements. So to understand the fact that even though when we describe nature on a quantum level, we say, oh, we, we just, there's, there's no way of getting around disturbing systems as we measure them. We also know from everyday experience, and well, not just everyday, but in the laboratory in classical physics, that we can make measurements on systems without disturbing them, or at least apparently so. So there must be something that emerges from quantum uh, physics when we have large enough systems of a certain type, where we can describe the measurement process and understand this, this fact that macroscopically, we can gain pretty much all of the information we want for pretty much no disturbance. So the way I'm going to tackle this problem is I'm going to take the specific example of n spins. So what we're going to take is our example for the rest of uh, this lecture, microscopic. Is that I have an ensemble of n spins all in the same state, and it's a tensor product, so they're all in the state psi tensored n, okay? And this is unknown, so this is, so we can also, I can write it as psi, I can also write it as a x tensor n or r tensor n to, to denote, um, oh, sorry, I said spins, I say n spin, spin half, let's put it. So this is now just a vector in the block sphere. And it's unknown. So we don't know what vector in the block sphere it is. And we want to estimate that. Now, in yesterday's tutorial question, you did one version of this. So we said, OK, if you have n spins, then one of the things you can do is to take each spin and, and measure it. And um, there were the two scenarios where you either probabilistically choose to measure it strongly or not, or you make a unsharp, a weak measurement on each spin. And then you, you were able to compare them, and you were able to see that uh, you can get information for in, this, in the case of large n, for less and less disturbance. But macroscopic measurements don't actually fall into this bracket. So the, yesterday's tutorial was more about if I really have an ensemble of n spins in the lab and I want to estimate state estimation. But a macroscopic measurement is, is somewhat different. If I have, for example, if my n is of the order of 10 to the 23, this would be a description of a real magnet. So I can have a block of material in which they're sitting, there are a lot of um, uh, electrons that, that are not in full orbit, so they're all of their spins. Uh, they each have a spin half magnetic moment, and they're all aligned in some direction. Somebody has prepared them. I just don't know what direction this is, and I need to measure this. And in that case, we, we don't actually break apart the material and, and take each spin out and measure it unsharply. What we do is we macroscopically couple it to some electric field, some other magnet, and doing so, we, uh, we infer something about the spin. So there, the observable, rather than being the spin of each one of them, is really the joint spin. So the sum of all of them, the observable, is the sum over, let's say, small n equals to 1 to n of sigma n, or let's say 
SN the thing. And now of course this is as usual when I write SN, when it's a composite system, what I mean is SN tensor identity on the rest of the spin. So it's it's always a composite object. So it's like like with the case of Hamiltonians. So I want to measure the composite spin. Now, what is the manner of doing this? So the, the simplest way of modeling this, just like in the like we discussed yesterday, is to couple this observable to some pointer. So one of the ways of doing this now, when you have a, a full spin um, that you want to consider, so you have the x, y, and z components, and you want to measure all of them, you would then use a pointer that also has these three degrees of freedom. So for example, you could use a pointer that has also x, y, and z, a three-dimensional pointer, and then you can couple your, your von Neumann measurement. So the von Neumann Hamiltonian will be of the form h is equal to some, well, you can say some coupling constant, or I, I don't need to put the coupling constant there. Uh, P of the pointer dot the spin of the system. And so this now, you see it has the same form for every spin component. It will translate along that direction by a particular amount. And so of course, U will be E to the minus I. And depending on how, how strong the Hamiltonian is and how long you run the unitary for, some, you will get some constant G. U dot S. Okay, now this has actually been considered in, in very nice detail and, and argued, and the conclusions are exactly the same that I will, well, or at least some of the conclusions I will be touching upon in this lecture in a paper on, um, let's see the, let me give you the uh, macroscopic quantum measurements. So pick. of non-commuting, I will finish it here, observables. And it's a theory from 2017. Okay, so what I want to do um, today is to actually provide a simpler argument that reproduces some of the conclusions that we would draw from there, because if you were to follow the technical details in, in full there, they are more complicated. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm again going to consider this case, but instead of considering the, the full case where we have a coupling between all of them, what I'm going to consider is, um, is that I only actually try and measure one of the components. So I'm going to have a the alternate case where the Hamiltonian, or let's just write the unitary, the unitary is just going to be e to the minus i, g, p of the pointer. Oh, it's not a p of the pointer, now it's a one-dimensional pointer, um, times, what is this is now a tensor, uh, sigma x or sx. Let me do sigma x, I, I don't want to worry about h bars. Okay. So yeah. This now looks like some sort of the interaction between, for example, Dyson interaction. Is this the unitary method? Yeah, so. Uh huh. It, because then it would make sense, which would be like a new or something. But or how do you define the enemy in this way? This is a good question. So this is really uh, what I've done here is I've just made it abstract and said there is some degree of freedom and there's a translation operator, but indeed you're right. So what, what, what this generalized momentum would. some translation operator of the degree of freedom that you will look at of the pointer. Yeah, but you're right, it's a good question. In, in, an, in an actual macroscopic question, uh, measurement, what this would be is, uh, yeah, it's not very immediately clear to me at the moment. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, in this case now for the unitary, I'm, I'm really going to take that the degree of freedom is X, its position, and here I have a momentum that's coupled to the spin. So again, it's this is more of an abstract sort of representation of it than, uh, than what you would do in an exact experiment. So the degrees of freedom might change a little bit. Uh, okay, so what do I want to do next? Right, so now what I do is I, I write down the state. So the state of one of the spins, I can always write down as in, in proportional to this form. So I can write my state R is square root of P plus plus square root of one minus P e to the i theta minus. This is the most general state. I mean, I can put a global phase on top of that as well, but if I just take that out because it will not matter to us, then I'm gonna have this sort of form, okay? And so our tensor N now is just this tensor N. And now what I want to do is I want to now um, write down sort of the spectrum of eigenvalues of sigma x corresponding to the single state and corresponding to the, the composite state. So in the case of a single state, uh, or single spin rather, then my if I were to draw the spectrum of eigenvalues, there are only two options it could take. This is minus one, plus one. Okay, so this is the eigenvalues. Let me just write them as lambda. And then I can and I can now plot the probability of getting under a strong measurement, for example, the probability that I would get that eigenvalue lambda. So in the case of a single spin, you can see the probability of being in plus is p, the probability of being in minus is uh, one minus p. So it's just as a delta function here, that's height p. And another delta function here, that's height one minus p. Right? Okay, now what happens when I have a tensor product of n of them? So now I, I, I expand this state, so I say r tensor n, and I write it now in full, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it down into, into um, blocks. So for example, my first state that I will have is going to be square root of p to the n plus tensor n, so just the product of this n times. And then I can keep on doing this, but of course now when I have, so for instance, now I'm gonna have the block and in each block, I'm going to take the block defined by M spins in plus and N spins, sorry, N minus M spins in minus. Okay, so the first block is just here. This is, this corresponds to M is equal to zero. Sorry, m is equal to n, it's the opposite. And the last block where I'll have only minus is going to be um, m is equal to zero. This is clear, right? I'm just writing the whole expansion. The point is that in each block, I have, of course, a number of states. So for instance, in the block, in the very uh, next block after this, where I have all of the spins except for one in plus and just one of the spins in minus, I have n such terms, right? Because I have n of the spins, so which one I can choose to be in minus changes. So this is really the binomial expansion. I'm going to have um, the number of terms in each of these blocks is going to be, so is the notation that he used to this notation or this notation for the number of ways to choose M out of N, the first one? Okay, so we use that. <laughs> I think that's particularly in, in, in India, as undergraduates, we always use the C, but anyway. Um, so the number of terms in each block is the number of ways you can choose n uh, from m, and the eigenvalue of each block, so the eigenvalue that you get corresponding to each block, lambda, is equal to, so you have m spins in plus, and then you have to subtract n minus m, so you're going to get 2m minus n, right? Because you take m times plus one, and then you add n minus one times minus one, so 2m minus n. Aha, uh -huh. and uh, yeah, so there are n such other. And the last thing is just to say is that the uh, the the amplitude of each of these will be uh, there will be square root of p times m and square root of one minus p times n minus m, and then phases. So 
the phases are really not going to be important for us, so I, I, we might as well ignore them from the beginning, because otherwise I'll just have to keep writing them all over the place. But yeah, you'll have different phases as well. Importantly, each of the terms inside this, each of the states inside this is an orthogonal state, of course, because it corresponds to different ones which are plus and minus. So what I've done here is I've written this out in, in an orthonormal basis with respect to the, the product basis of plus and minus. OK? Are there any questions? So I, I forgot to say at the beginning of the lecture, it's especially important for this lecture for you to interrupt me whenever we might uh, not be following a particular argument. Because as I go through the argument, there will be a lot of approximations and estimations. And it's important to keep track of them or to at least be, let's say, comfortable with uh, understanding them. Yes. Yes, that's the, 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 the P is in the square root. And, and that's important because now what I want to do next is I want to write the, um, so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to write the probability for getting a particular eigenvalue. And there, what you have to do is you have to add the, you, you can't just take the, the sum of the amplitudes in the brackets. You have to add the probabilities of each of those states in the bracket. So then that will become, there the square roots will disappear. So if I take, so for instance, the probability that I have all of the states in plus is the square of that first term. So it's P to the N, that's where it goes. And then the probability in the nth block, so maybe I write that right there. So the probability that lambda is equal to 2M minus N is given by the total probability in this subspace, which is equal to the number of terms that are there, NM times the probability the of each term, which is the amplitude square. So that's P to the M uh, one minus P to the N minus N. And this is really the binomial expansion because now if you sum this over, over M, you'll just get one. Sorry, why lambda is, is of that? Ah, so in each of these terms, I have, uh, so actually maybe I write it this way. Each of these terms here corresponds to plus with m and minus with n minus m. Okay, so they're all of this form. The only difference between each term in this block is the ordering. So for example, let me do, let me write, okay, let me write a small example on the next board that makes it clear. So imagine that I just had, is two already clear? Yeah, so imagine that I just had two spins. Then I'm going to have square root of p plus square root of 1 minus p minus tensor 2. And this is equal to, so the first term is indeed uh, square root of p 2. I'm, I'm going to write it this fashion just to match there. So I have plus tensor 2. Then I have the second block. And, and as I said here, there are two terms here. So one of the terms is, um, plus tensor minus, and the other term is minus tensor plus. Of course, both of them come with square root of p, square root of one minus p. And finally, there is square root of one minus p squared minus two times. And here now, the eigenvalue of this is plus two. The eigenvalue, so lambda is equal to plus two for this one. In for each of these, lambda is equal to zero because it's plus minus one. And for each of these, lambda is equal to minus two. So the central block is the one that you, you see there. So I have a, a fixed number of pluses and minus. It's just the ordering that, that changes between them. And indeed, this is now the number of terms is equal to uh, two C one, right? Number of ways of choosing one out of two. And that's all. Is that okay? Okay. Now I want to write down the eigenvalues of this. So let me do so. It's important graph. So this is now the spectrum of eigenvalues. And I'm going to do the probability. Now, what are the eigenvalues? They stretch from, if all of them are in plus, you have n. If all of them are in minus, you have minus n. So I have, if I go one, two, dot, 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 dot all the way to plus n and minus n, OK? So 
So those are the eigenvalues. And the next thing that I do, which is the same thing that, that I did in the, in the original one, is I plot the probabilities of being in each of these. Now, of course, I technically I should draw delta functions on each of these, but I'm just going to draw the envelope of the delta functions rather than the delta functions themselves. Now, here's where we start um, using the fact that n is large. So we are always going to do this for the case of n being large. So when n is large, we know that the, well, the binomial uh, distribution, as well as actually any probability distribution, follows the central limit theorem. It becomes close to, uh, or at least a rescaled version becomes close to a Gaussian. So the binomial distribution for that is going to look something like some peaked thing. Now, where is, what, what is this distribution defined by? So the first thing we say is the mean of this peak is going to be at n times the original mean. So what I didn't write down in the top thing, I write down that. So for this one here, I can write down that the mean mu is equal to, so p times plus one, plus one minus p times minus one. So that's just two p minus one. So that's that. And I'm not going to get sigma squared on that board. So I'm going to have to do that lower. So what is the mean here? So the mean here is at 2p minus 1 times n. Okay, the mean of the full thing is just that mean. And then the other quantity that is important is the variance, sigma or sigma squared. You can define either way. Now, what is sigma squared? Again, we have n independent spins. So sigma squared is going to be n times the, the sigma squared of the, of the first one. Now, okay, let me calculate the, so let me just write it down. Sigma squared of the first one is 4p times one minus p. The reason is because the second moment is just going to give you one. Um, and then you, which is equal to, let's say this, the second moment squared. My, uh, I'm not going to go to the calculation, but this is sigma squared. It's also the same thing that you would get from a random walk. Okay, so sigma squared is that times n now because we have n of them, so the variance of the total thing is, is that. All right, is this clear? Have you seen the central limit theorem before in various cases? Oh, okay, good. There's some familiarity with that. Very good. So now I'm finally going to do the thing about measuring it. So let me say that now I have, um, I'm going to use a pointer and it's going to be some, so the pointer is going to be some, it's going to be some phi of X, which is symmetric about zero um, also I'm going to take for simplicity that it is real. This is not really a big assumption, just to make it simpler. Um, and width of the pointer is, a pro is of the order of delta. Now, what do I mean by this? This is a statement that until, until I tell you the shape of the pointer doesn't mean much. So for instance, I could take my pointer to just be a block, uh, and then it's really the width is exactly delta. I could take it to be a Gaussian, in which case the parameter, the, the standard deviation of the Gaussian would be delta squared. Many cases, but effectively what I'm going to do is the, the width is going to be of order delta. So the variance of the pointer itself is going to be of order delta, okay? And it's a reasonably well-behaved pointer. So it's, let's say, sort of, it's smooth. So it's not like it's got some crazy fluctuations and all. It's like the pointers that we were discussing when we discussed weak measurements yesterday. Okay, so I have that. And now I want to calculate what I'm going to get, so. Right, okay, so the first thing I want to calculate now, I think this will be the easier thing to do so, is the information gain. So what is the information gain of the measurement? And the way I, I calculate the information gain or I calculate a quantity related to information gain is, is via the following. So. What am I going to do? I'm going to start with my pointer that is, let's choose another color, green, let's say. So my pointer is some, some wave function about zero. And then it's going to move 
according to the eigenvalue of the cyst of the of the state. So basically, my state over there, each block. Okay, let's write it down. So what I'm going to get is, uh, yeah, okay. So R tensor n coupled to phi of x is going to transform. And how is it going to transform? Basically, each one of those blocks is has a particular eigenvalue, and that eigenvalue is going to be the shift in the wave function. So that's going to transform in the same way. It's square root of p n tensor plus tensor n, and this is now going to be phi of x minus n plus dot dot dot. And when we go to the, the mth block here, what I'm going to get, as I said before, is square root of p to the m, square root of 1 minus p to the n minus m. And then I have my n choose m terms with plus tensor m and minus tensor n minus m, but in different orders. And this is now going to be coupled to the pointer, which has moved by that. So x minus on the other space, sorry. Then said phi of x minus that value, 2m minus n. OK? So this is going to be the joint state of system and pointer. Is this clear? So what I've done is I've just applied the same von Neumann model of the measurement that we discussed yesterday. Every pointer state shifts by that much. OK, and then at the end, I'm going to look at the pointer. And I'm going to infer from the, the x that I get on the pointer. So here I've really taken the coupling so that x moves by the eigenvalue. I'm going to infer from the x that I see on the pointer what the state of the, the spin of the system is. OK? So, So here's the question now. So the, the thing I want to do is I want to find out an estimate. So I estimate the value of p by taking the value of x. So I could, for example, look at the value of x of the pointer. But of course, x of the pointer is, so I've taken n spins, and I really want to, I don't want to estimate this quantity. I want to only want to estimate the thing with p. So I estimate, well, I don't estimate p, I estimate uh, 2p minus 1, effectively. So or let's put it as I estimate the average of the average of sigma x, or actually, now I know what I'm going to say. I want to estimate rx by xq. But so what I do is by xq over n. So when I take the value of the pointer divided by n, then I rescale it. And I'm, I'm essentially estimating 2p minus 1, this quantity here. Right, so that's one thing, and yeah, so so this is now my, let's say my, um, this is now a random variable. This is something for which I have a particular probability distribution over what values I can get of, of this from the measurement, okay? So the mean of this random variable, yes? Ah, uh, the reason the reason for for the lecture is just for simplicity. So, as I said, the original thing really does the whole thing with p dot s. But the problem then is that you you have a three dimensional pointer and you have non commuting observables, so the the calculation is much more complicated. So my my goal and so my goal here was to by only doing the estimation of one of the directions to make a simpler calculation that then you can essentially you can follow without going into the details. Yeah. Yes. 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 Ah, oh, but I, I mean, I've, all of this is done in the X now. So I've, I've chosen to write everything in the X basis for that purpose. So 2p minus 1 is really 
only related to the, the X moment of the spin, the X component of the spin. Ah, yes, yes, indeed. Yes, yes, that, yeah, indeed. So from that point where I, where I said, I'm only doing, going to do it in X, then I've only been working in the X spaces and everything plus and minus are the eigenstates of X, yes. Yes, so what is the mean of, of this, so of this uh, XQ divided by N? So this is something that, I mean, uh, this is very easy to calculate. So this is essentially the expectation value of the pointer at the end of the measurement. And as I said yesterday, the expectation value of the pointer is really just the expectation value of the observable that you have. So the mean of this, of this quantity is just going to be 2p minus 1. OK. Oh, 1316. Ah. Time. The next question is, what is the uncertainty in this? And the way I calculate the uncertainty is, oh, maybe, uh, yeah, this is fine. I simply add up the uncertainty of the two independent things. So one is that I have an uncertainty in the eigenvalue itself because of the fact that I'm not in a, in, in a state corresponding to a single eigenvalue. And then I have the uncertainty. Oh, this was not prepared. Right. So, so what is the, the variance? In, in that, in xq upon n. So I, I do this by, by considering two uncertainties. So when I, when I have the case that there is a particular uh, random process with some variance, and then I make a measurement which has its own variance, and, and the two variances are independent of each other, uh, which, is, which is the case here, because I have a pointer which has its own variance, and the variance is not affected by the measurement. So then in this case, this is just going to be the variance in, let's say, a measurement of lambda by n plus the variance in the, in the pointer thing. So the variance in uh, x of, the, of q divided by n. So uh, this is now. So this is of the original one. So the un uh, the original state of the pointer. Okay. Yeah. So what is the variance in lambda over n? So that is going to be. So we've written the variance uh, for n. So the case. Yeah. Yeah, that's just going to be delta squared, indeed. So this, so now they're just the sum of these two. So this is 4p times 1 minus p divided by n, because the variance in lambda is that. So the variance in lambda by n, remember, it's, it's variance, so it's squared. So the, it's going to divide by n squared. So it's this one. And then I'm going to have plus the variance in this. So this is going to be delta squared divided by n squared. OK? Now. Uh, should I already do it here? No, I'll keep it as delta squared. This is fine. Yes. Aha, yes. So now I'm going to make a choice. And the reason I'm going to make the choice is for what comes next. So I'm going to choose, and this is not, actually, it's not a choice. It's just a reparameterization. I'm just going to choose delta to scale in this fashion. I'm going to say this is equal to square root of n times cn. OK? And so then, and so Cn can be, so what I'm doing here is I'm saying as n increases, I'm allowed to choose the width of the pointer to match it in some fashion. And this is the function that I choose, in which case then I get that the variance is equal to 4p 1 minus p upon n plus, and the square root of n squared 1 over n is going to come out. So I'm going to get Cn squared upon n. And the reason I did this, so here already you see now that the, uh, the variance is just 4p 1 minus p plus cn squared upon n. Okay, 
And in fact, I assume that this is increasing with n. So this increases with n, in which case this would approximately be equal to Cn squared for upon n because the 4pa1 minus p is a, is a constant term. Okay. Right. So this takes care of information. And now I want to do disturbance. So let's do the... Now, I, I don't have a, a quantity that I will calculate for the disturbance. Well, there is a little quantity, but it's not going to be like yesterday, but I really have a, a fidelity. What I'm going to do is I'm going to see how that density matrix changes under the transformation that I've done. So, yeah. Ah, so sigma squared refers to the variance of the probability distribution of eigenvalues of the system. Whereas delta, the capital delta is the, uh, is the variance of the pointer. Yeah, so, so somehow, and, and so the reason for this is, so this comes from statistics. When, you, when, you, when you're making a measurement which has an uncertainty on another var variable, which also has its own uncertainty, and if the two things are independent, then the uncertainty in the result that you get is you just add up the uncertainties in each of these. So. So the, yeah, so this is something defended in uh, in statistical theory. Yeah. Okay, so how do I do this disturbance? I'm going to look at the density matrix. So now yesterday, actually, what I'm going to write down is something which is analogous to what you had yesterday. So remember yesterday, in um, in the case of of the of a spin, yeah, of, of one spin where you had uh, that your pointer moves by plus one or minus one. When we looked at the state of the spin at the end, we had this uh, the, the, the statement that the diagonal elements remain the same. So we had rho s was, if I remember correctly, so c plus mod squared plus 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 c minus mod squared minus minus. And then you had plus c plus c minus star uh, phi, ah, sorry where it becomes a inner product, phi of x plus one, phi of x minus one, and then plus Hermitian conjugate. So remember this thing from yesterday. And, and the reason is, so the more general uh, version of this is that what you end up getting is rho s is equal to, so first you have the diagonal element, so you have the sum over, over n of, let's say, cn, mod squared of n, n, where n is sort of an, these are the eigenstates that you measured. And then for every, uh, for every pair of off-diagonal elements, what you end up is Cn, Cm star, and then the overlap between the pointers that have been shifted by the difference. So phi of x minus some coupling constant g times m with phi of x minus g times m. So essentially, in your state, like in that state, where is the state that I wrote? Yeah, in that state there, when I take that state and tensor it with its uh, self to form the density matrix, so the Brian ket you see each term simply has phi, uh, one state of the pointer shifted and another state of the pointer shifted. For the diagonal elements of the system, they are the same state. And so when you take the inner product, they, they just become one, so they, they remain the same. But it's the off diagonal elements that all gain this overlap. Is that, yeah? No, this is just row of s. So I trace out, uh, ah, sorry, I have forgotten the ket bra, sorry. Uh, yeah, n, n, m, yes, sorry, on the system. Yeah, thank you. Okay, right. Okay, so now I do the same thing for that. And now I'm not, I'm gonna write this in like density matrix form. So it's a big density matrix form now for row prime of s. And so effectively, what I see here is, so in each, each uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to order it in the same way that I did here. So each block here is of the order of m pluses. So you, I start from all of them. So n of them are in the state plus and zero in the state minus. Here m are in the state plus, And the last one is zero in the state plus. So of course, each of these is not actually a single element column, but it's a block because they are, of course, as I said, n choose m ways of, of doing it in block. 
But the nice thing is within each block, the lambda is the same. So within each block, the density matrix is not changing because within each block, all of these elements, the overlap of the pointer states will all be one. So basically for my, what I'm going to get is that I'm going to get uh, the same density matrix that I had initially, which I'm not going to write, but what I'm going to write down is the multiplying factor for each of them. So in each case here, I'm going to have a, so for example, let's take, this is, no, this is M pluses, and this is uh, K pluses, this, this point. So here, I know that the, the overlap that I'm going to get is the following. I'm going to get phi of X minus M, phi of X minus K. Okay, so it's basically, well, the, the G is gone here because here I, I really use the case that your, your pointer really moves by exactly the eigenvalue. And so in one case, the pointer is going to move by M and in the other case, it's going to move by K. So the off diagonal elements has this overlap attached to it. So basically every element in the density matrix of the system is going to be whatever the original element was multiplied by something like this, which tells you immediately where, where when M is equal to K, then this overlap is one and you just have the original one. But for M not equal to K, you get, you get a dampening because of course this overlap is always less or equal to one. Okay. Right. That time I have four minutes left. Okay, so is this part clear? This is a bit, as I said, it's a, it's a more of a geometric description. So one has to follow it. You can, again, if you do it in the case of two spins, it's an easy example to see how that, that, that works. Uh, so now the last thing that I'm going to do, and this is the reason for the particular choice of Delta. Ah, I just erased the argument that I needed. Um, Let me still. So, in the case that we have, uh, yeah, so do you know Chebyshev's inequality? You heard of it. So, I'll just briefly state it here. So, Chebyshev's inequality is if you have a, if you have a property distribution with um, mu and sigma, so this is the mean. And this is the standard deviation or the square root of the vari uh, variance. Then the probability that if you actually measure that observable, that you get an answer x away, uh, an answer a certain distance away from the from the mean, uh, to be um, greater or equal to uh, thing. Let me write this here. Uh, ah, k times sigma is less or equal to or less than one over k squared. So this gives you a very easy way of um, bounding essentially the probability that you are a certain number of standard deviations away from your mean for any property distributions, okay? And this is now the reason why I chose that particular delta. So what I'm going to say now, aha, I, okay, there's a lot to write and I keep erasing what I need. So. My argument that I wanted to use here was the following. So what we can say, now that we know that each term changes by this much, is that we can say, well, I have a band of terms here. So obviously as M and K become more and more different, corresponds to going further and further away from the diagonal because on the diagonal, M is equal to K. And as you go one side or the other, you increase M or, in or K and keep the other constant. So basically, given that my width of my, my pointer has a my pointer has a particular width, it means that this factor that's multiplying the term is just going to keep decreasing as I go away and away from the diagonal. So on the diagonal it's one. And as long as M minus K, so I, I draw a band here. And this band is determined by saying that M minus K or the absolute value is less or equal to delta. So I have a difference between the 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 uh, so I basically have that my pointer is shifted to something that's of the order of something less than its width, which means here the overlap is likely to be reasonably high. Outside of this band, the overlap is going likely to be low. Okay, so this the the density matrix in this band is going to be um, preserved. The density matrix in that band is going to change. 
And now in order to calculate the disturbance, what I want to argue is the following. If I choose my delta to be smart enough, what I can ensure is that the part that actually is changed, where this overlap is actually going to zero, is actually a part where the state does not exist in any way. And here I use the fact that I, I just erased that, uh, that graph. I'll just draw it briefly here again. So I use the fact that when I have this property distribution of where the, the wave function, where the, the pointer eigenvalues can be, it's actually very peaked around this mean value and around a particular variance. And this variance is of order square root of n, basically. Okay, so what, that's the reason I chose delta to be of this form. So I can write the following expression. I apologize, this lecture is going to run a little bit longer. So I say now the probability that my lambda, the, uh, the value that I would get if I measured this total spin, minus the mean of the lambda, whatever that mean is. So in, the, in our case, it's uh, 2p minus 1 times n, but I don't need to write it explicitly, is greater than and now here I want to say it's it's the width of the of the of the pointer. So I want to say what is the probability that my uh, the eigenvalue that I get, the, the distance from the mean, will actually beat the pointer width itself. So that's delta is less or equal to something. And now this I will put in the form that I wrote. So I write this as square root of n times c n. In fact. I think it would have been more clever to write it as square root of n times Delta is equal to sigma times C of n. So this is going to be less than 1 over C n squared. OK. And so now I have, I have the statement. My wave function, or my, my density matrix, is going to be approximately preserved in a band corresponding to delta. And the probability of, n, of being outside that band of delta, so that means uh, that bounds the essentially the magnitude of any of the off-diagonal elements that I could get there, the probability of being outside that band is bound by this function, 1 over cn squared. And so now I have my two quantities that I, I look at. So my disturbance is given by this quantity here. Because if I'm outside of that band, that is something where the coherence is destroyed. And so my state has changed a lot. If I'm inside the band, my state has not changed a lot. So the, the disturbance is given by, it's some function of 1 over cn squared. So now, of course, if I calculated something explicit, like the fidelity or trace distance or something like that, I would get something that depends on cn. It's not clear what the power would be. But this is measured by this 1 over cn squared. And my information gain is measured by cn squared. uncertainty in the measurement is given by that quantity, which is cn squared divided by n. OK, and now I see I can actually, for, for n is equal to 1, I actually have no, no freedom here. Again, I have the, the thing that if I try to decrease my, if I try to decrease my disturbance, I will decrease my information and vice versa. But once n becomes large enough, I can choose cn in such a way that this becomes as small as I like, and the, this also becomes as small as I like. So explicitly, what I have to do is I have to choose cn of the order of n to any alpha, where alpha is in this interval between 0 and half. Because if I choose n to the alpha, where alpha is in 0 and half, that means cn is an increasing function with n. 
and my disturbance will decrease as a function of n. That's guaranteed. And as long as alpha is less than half, then Cn squared is going to be something where it's less than n to the power 1. And so this will still decrease. So this will now become of the order of n to the minus 2 alpha. And this will become of the order of n to the minus so 2 alpha minus 1. Minus 1. Okay, and you want both of these to be small. You want the disturbance to be small and the uncertainty to be small. So all you have to choose is n uh, of alpha to be between zero and half, okay? All right, so this was effectively a hand-waving argument, but the goal of it was to say, when you have a very large number of spins together, then since you do not have to measure the eigenvalue to the precision of plus or minus one, you only really have to measure it to the precision of plus or minus square root of n, because that's where the state uh, lies in. And that as a square root of n divided by n, of course, is something that becomes smaller and smaller. So you will be estimating it better and better. Then you can use a pointer whose width is also somewhere in between. So the pointer has to essentially be much broader than plus or minus one. It has to be much broader than square root of n, because then it ensures that you do not disturb. But it has to be much less than n, because if you choose it to be of the order of n, then you get no information. So one of the things you can check is now if you take the original point and you say square root of n times cn, where n is between 0 and half, you see that the pointer width is also between square root of n and n. So you get being above square root of n means you get no disturbance. Being less than n means you still get information. And as n increases, you can have as much of disturbance and information as you like. I will write uh, notes eventually for the yesterday's and today's lecture. And so I will go through this in maybe slightly more detail or less uh, rush than I had to uh, in this lecture. Uh, but this is not of the time scale of immediately, so I ho hope to have done it before I return for the, the continuation of the lecture in May. Uh, but with that, I leave you, uh, sorry for the delay, until I see you again in May. Thank you. <laughs>